Would you take your notes out this morning? I want to welcome you back home to CV Church. We've had a great year, 2017 uh, breakthrough. I want to just thank you for all of your participation and your time and your talents, your tithe, your treasure, your touch. We've been able to make a difference this year, and it's been exciting. And uh, we are a, a, a church that is a multicultural church. We thrive on the diversity. We think that is incredibly important. If you've gone through uh, the Bible bookmark with us this year, would you find in your bulletin, here's the Bible bookmark we're starting. I want to encourage you, if you haven't been following with us, I encourage you to do that. And at the bottom, it, it gives an acronym, SOAP. What that means is as you walk through the, verse, the chapters that you read each day, I would encourage you to start a journal with me. And what you do is when there's a certain scripture that just catches your attention, you write it down and then you think through it during your devotions, what's the observation that you have on that verse? And then you write out, how am I going to apply that verse? And then you pray a prayer. I, I encourage you and implore you, this is the foundation of having breakthrough in 2018. First of all, being a man, being a woman that's committed to the word. And secondly, it's being a man, being a woman who's committed to prayer. When you are reading the scriptures daily and you're soaping, that's how you get cleansed. You focus on the scripture that the Holy Spirit brings to you. You write down your observations. You write down your application. And then you go ahead and you write out your prayer. That's how the word stays with you. And then we're not just a multicultural church, but we're intergenerational. So from the womb to our deathbed, we just believe it's really important that we join together. So uh, today, I want to talk to you about hope for overcoming doubt. This is a message that I'm confident is relevant to every single person in the room. Because in a group this size, certainly many of us right now are in a season of spiritual, emotional, relational, financial, vocational, intellectual, and physical doubt. Our world has been turned upside down. We're living with situations that are very painful that causes us to have doubt. Some of you are probably not in a season of doubt right now, but it might be just around the corner. Some event is going to come into your life and it's going to turn your world upside down and lead you into a season of questions and doubts. Some of you right now may have a family member, a friend, a close worker who is going through a season of doubt. God wants you to be a messenger of his life and light in this coming week. The fact is doubting comes naturally for all of us. We're born questioners. Babies, when they begin to talk, one of the first Words they learn is why. And just because you become a follower of Jesus Christ does not mean that all of your doubts and all of your questions are forever erased. In fact, the Bible is filled with men and women who are devoted, passionate followers of God, but who regularly find themselves in a situation in which they're questioning their faith and they're questioning God. One of these persons in the Bible, his name is Asaph. Asaph wrote quite a few of the chapters in the book of Psalms. Listen in as Asaph shares some of his doubts. When you listen, you can hear his words, and you can hear the agony, and you can hear the angst, and you can hear the struggle. You can hear his brutally honest questions that he brings to God. Follow along with you as I read Psalm 77, 1 to 9. I cry out to God without holding back. Oh, that God, you would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long I pray with hands lifted towards heaven and pleading. There can be no joy for me until he acts. I thank God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. You don't let me sleep. I'm too distressed even to pray. I think of the good old days, long since ended, when my nights were filled with joyful songs, and I search my soul, and I think about the difference now. Has the Lord, notice these questions, has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never show me again his favor? Have you ever asked anything like that? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be kind? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? Let those questions sink in for a moment. There's a common 
thread that ties all of these questions together. It is the thread of doubt. Will God reject us forever? Does his promises no longer stand? Has God forgotten how to be merciful? Wow. Those are questions that aren't very politically correct in some circles. Some churches portray a kind of Christianity where Christians are never allowed to ask questions. They act as if they never struggle with doubts. But I'm glad to be a part of our church here where it's okay to be real. With no pretense, no facade, to show up with your questions at a raw and gut level. That is okay. God isn't threatened with those questions and neither should we be as a church. Would you agree with that? Because we all struggle with them. Martin Luther once said, knowledge and doubt are inseparable to man. Only God and certain madmen and women have no doubts at all. I think he's right. There are gut level questions that I want you and I to struggle with in our time together this morning. As I was preparing for this teaching, I continued to think through what is God's purpose for allowing you and I to struggle? If you've been reading through the Bible with us this year, we just completed today our second reading of the book of Revelation. What an incredible book. I've heard so many people ask me, Scott, why doesn't God make our lives easier? Why is it that when you become a follower of Christ, why doesn't God just drop in the mail a blueprint for the rest of your life full of explanations? Or why doesn't he just, when you face a crisis, send you an email explaining to you all his purposes and the reasons why he's doing what he's doing in your life? I've thought about this issue of pain, problems, and trouble for a long time. Here's where my biblical search has led me to this point in my life. The reason God doesn't make it easier is because he knows us. He knows our nature. He knows our tendency. God knows that when life is easy and when everything is making sense and when things are comfortable and we've got it all buttoned down, our tendency is to forget God. We looked at last week how God uses our trials and our troubles as an opportunity for us to learn patience and endurance and steadfastness and stamina. The tests to our faith are all about emotional and and spiritual and relational maturity. What do we call a child that doesn't face problems and has everything done for them? Yes, spoiled. Life equals difficulty and pain. The mature person embraces the pain and learns to trust Jesus in and through them. One of the lessons I picked up very strongly in the book of Revelation is that in the end times especially, Persecution, difficulty, and betrayal is the normal way for the Christian life. Because our world is so antagonistic against Christ, if you're going to buoy yourself and stand up for Christ, you are going to be antagonized. Because that is the spirit of the Antichrist in this culture. It hates God, and it hates anyone who loves Christ. So we're not to be frightened. Some of us, we don't share our faith because you're afraid of the backlash. Jesus Christ said, you're blessed when that happens. So stand up and be counted for. That's exactly what he says to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6 when they're about ready to enter the promised land. And here's what God says to them through Moses. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land that he swore to give your ancestors Abram, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a land filled with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. Now, notice what he's saying. The houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from systems that you did not dig. And you're going to eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. In other words, you didn't do anything to get this. When you have eaten your fill in the land... Be careful not to forget the Lord. It is a temptation for us when everything is going pretty well 
and ease begins to set in, he says the first thing that's going to be attacked is your faith in God. Do not forget the Lord. He's the one that rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear, that means reverence, that means stand in awe of the Lord your God and serve him. When you take an oath, you must use only his name. Now, God is most interested in yours and my relationship with him. When everything comes easy, when life makes sense and there's no doubts because of pain and turmoil, it is our tendency, church, to forget God. When life falls apart, when doubts arise, the tendency is to look for the answer. But God wants us not to look for an answer as much as he wants you and I to look for and to him. Would you notice this next statement in your notes, and you might want to fill it in. It is our nature to look for reasons. It is God's nature to offer relationship. It is our nature to look for reasons. It is God's nature to offer a relationship. Now let that sink in. We think the answer to our debt, doubts is explanation. God says, the answer to your doubts is me. It is God's higher value to teach you how to trust in him in the midst of your doubts than to just simply provide an explanation and proof as to why you shouldn't have doubts. But we want an explanation, don't we? Because we're wired that way. We want to be able to connect all the dots. We're very much like Thomas in the New Testament when after Jesus had resurrected from the dead, he appeared to his disciples one day. Now, Thomas wasn't there. When he came back, they said, hey, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Listen to his response in John 20, 25. Thomas replied, I will not believe it unless... I see the nail wounds in his hands and I put my fingers into them and I place my hand into the wounds of his side. So a few days later, the Bible says that Jesus appeared to Thomas in John 20, 27. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hands into the wound into my side. Don't be faithless any longer, Thomas. Believe. Now, Jesus put a higher premium on faith than he did visible proof. Blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe me anyway. Blessed are those that don't have the answers. They haven't been able to connect all the dots, but they choose to trust me because of my nature and because of my character. They believe in me. Blessed are those whose minds are filled with doubt, yet they choose faith anyway. I want to be sure that we really understand this, loved ones, because like Thomas, we all have doubts in life's journey. Would you agree? Having doubts, hear me, does not make you less spiritual. It doesn't make you less of a Christian. In fact, seasons of doubt can lead to some of the greatest spiritual growth, and I want to declare to you, and that's why I'm teaching this at the last, the last Sunday of this year, for some of us, your breakthroughs are going to be in those specific areas where you have the greatest doubt. And I want you to have faith for that with me this year. That where you doubt that God exists spiritually or that he's wanting to be involved. Emotionally, maybe you just think, I'm going to be depressed for the rest of my life. Or I just have these character defects. I'm emotionally damaged and I don't think I can rise above it. I want to declare to you there's breakthrough for you in 2018. In relationships where you were raised in very dysfunctional, abusive relationships. And you just keep drawing the wrong kind of people to you. God has a breakthrough for you if you're willing to reach out and take it in 2018. If you've just fumbled along in your finances or your vocation or in your intellect, your brain just isn't firing like you really need it to or physically or you're sexually broken from the past and even today you can feel that kind of brokenness. I want you to believe with me that this year, 2018, is going to be the year of breakthrough for you. Amen? Having doubts 
or in fact, a season of doubts can, and I believe and want to declare to you, it's going to lead us to some of our greatest areas of growth. So what does it mean that we allow doubt to work for us and not become proud and arrogant of our skepticism? That's where some of us have to guard ourselves. Some of us, maybe you've become so proud of your ability to be a cynic or to be a skeptic that proud and arrogance has, has got in there, and you just need to break through. You need to be able to humble yourself and go, yeah, I'm a skeptic, yeah, I'm a cynic, yeah, I have a hard time trusting, but I believe in this year, 2018, I'm going to see a breakthrough in that. So we need to take action that demonstrates that we're willing to trust Jesus instead of just simply demanding more answers by asking more questions. So I have three major points today. Look at point, point number one. Three benefits that doubt can serve. Look at the first one. Doubts can drive me to Father God. Oftentimes when our lives are turned upside down and life doesn't make sense, I'm in a crisis, I'm more prone to seek God for his help and his presence. If you read through the book of Revelation with us, and if you haven't, I ask that you go back and get that done today. It's really amazing how many times the judgments, the bolts of judgments were poured out on people. And then it says, and they refused to repent anyway. They just bored into their idolatry. They bored into their sexual immorality. And no matter how painful it became, they refused to repent. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I don't want to see any of us that way this year. God allows pain. God allows disappointment. God allows betrayal, loved ones. It's meant to cause us to turn towards him, not to harden your heart against him. Asaph starts his psalm in verse 1 and 2. I cry out to God without holding back. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. He searched. Psalms 119 and verse uh, 10 says, I've tried to find you with all of my heart. There is a certain element of search that doubt is meant to ignite in your heart and mind. All night long I pray with hands lifted towards heaven, pleading, there can be no joy for me until he acts. How is that for letting your doubts and your problems drive you to God? God allows pain in your life so that you will wholeheartedly turn to him. He's not being mean. Your pain, your problems, your disappointments, that's simply God inviting you to come to him. Isn't that beautiful? Now, you can either get angry, and you can resent him, and you can resist him, or you can simply say, I'm not blaming you for all the mess that's going on, but I am going to say yes to your invitation. And please get inside this mess with me and help me figure it out. Letter B, doubts can cause me to wrestle with life's difficult questions. When I'm walking along and everything's good, life's easy, everything's comfortable, we have a tendency to live life at a surface level. But when yours and my world gets turned upside down, you lose a job, the doctor says to you, it's cancer, or your spouse either walks out or is threatening to walk out on you, or you find out that your child has a sexual addiction problem, or a drinking, or a drug, or some other kind of problem, all of a sudden, it moves beyond the surface. Now it's down to some soul-searching questions that every one of us have to wrestle with with some time in our life. Questions like, why me? What did I do to deserve this? Where are you in all of this? What is your plan? What were you thinking? With some indictment in it. Of allowing me to experience pain, especially at this time of life. That's why during the Christmas season, I told you, I, we, we, we focused on hope is born. Hope for when you're defeated. Hope for when you're depressed. Hope for when you're discouraged. Now it's hope for when you're in doubt. These are all important questions. And until times of doubt and crisis rise, often you won't ever really get around to asking them. And then look at letter C. Here's the third benefit. Doubt can actually deepen your faith. When you walk in times of doubt, 
You come out on the other side when our faith is deepened and our confidence in God is strengthened. If you're doubting certain aspects of Christianity or your relationship with him, please hear me. That is okay. Ask him to make himself real to you, and he will. Look at point number two. Doubts plus surrender plus trust equals freedom. Notice that. This is a very strategically loaded statement. Doubt plus surrender plus trust equals freedom. Let me explain. If it's often true in our experience that seasons of doubt lead us to a place of surrender. We often surrender because we have no other options. We get to a place where we say, God, I just don't understand. That doesn't make sense to me. I have my doubts. It's not in my control. But I choose to yield to your will and to do what you want me to do. It's in those times, church, that surrender, that now you begin to really learn to trust God and trust that even when you don't understand, he is a good God and he can be trusted with your life. When you walk through that sequence, doubt to surrender to trust, and it equals freedom, because now you have the freedom not to be in control, to not have to try to, try to achieve or approve, approve anything to somebody or to yourself. That is a great place to get. Because when you surrender, you die to yourself, you die to your own agenda. Now you're submitted and placed in the hands of a good and gracious God that can be trusted with your life. So doubt can actually drive you and me to God. It forces us to wrestle with these difficult questions. Doubt can actually deepen your trust and relationship and faith in God. So for the next few minutes, I want to look at Psalm 77, and I want to look at some practical steps that Asaph took to deal with his own doubts. Look at point number three. Three practical steps on how to turn your doubt into faith. Any takers on this? A half of us. Okay. Look at letter A. Remember God's track record. This is about gaining perspective. This is about stepping back and looking at the big picture. Psalm 77, 11, 12 says this. I recall, notice it's intentional. It's purposeful. We talk about the purpose-driven life a lot here. I intentionally recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about them. Would you circle the four words uh, there in your notes? Recall, remember, thoughts, and thinking. Circle the four words recall, remember, thoughts, and thinking. They all refer to yours and my mind because here's the principle I want you to get. Memory is a friend to faith. I can give personal testimony to this because, because I've walked with the Lord for almost more now than 60 years. I have been a Christian. God has an amazing track record in my life of faithfulness. When I didn't understand and even when I had a lot of doubts, he has a track record of being faithful to God. Somebody just said to me, even this morning, said, you know, I, I, I just, I don't understand. How can you, you're never depressed. You're never frustrated. You're never this. I said, have you been listening to me? I talk about my depression. I talk about my foibles, my flaws, my failures all the time, don't I? I give you anything but an ideal picture of who I am. I'm just somebody that, that has been able to respond to God's faith. And to his goodness and his character. But most of the mornings I wake up, I'd rather just stay in bed. You have to drag yourself out sometimes, don't you? Yeah. Sometimes it's not till after two, three miles of my walk, I actually am aware I'm walking and I become conscious. And then I start praying. 
<laughs> People say, you, you pray the moment you get up out of bed. Well, I'd like to tell you I do that every morning, but no, sometimes it takes me a while to get going. And then I have to ask God to forgive me for my pouting and my whimpering and my whining, and then I kick it into gear. I can tell you I will get it kicked into gear sooner or later. Okay? I'm disciplined enough to get it kicked in. I don't do it as quickly as I would like. In this passage, Asaph says, I recall all you have done. I remember your wonderful deeds. I cannot stop thinking about them. Some translations say this. I meditate on your wonderful works. I ponder them because they're true. And these stories in the Bible are historically verifiable. If God is able to to take two million people out of bondage in Egypt and deliver them, if God is able to part the waters of the Red Sea and an actual miracle, and if God by his power is able to knock down walls around an entire city of Jericho, if God is able to take Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and deliver them from the fiery furnace completely unharmed, if God is able to shut the mouths of lions so that they don't eat the prophet Daniel, if God is able to take his own son and raise him from the dead, maybe there's a track record there that shows that God can take care of you too. That's what memory will do for you. That's why you have to actively recall. That's why, loved ones, I want you to be diligent in reading through the Bible with me this year. This book will save your life. It's the God of the Bible that will save your life, but this is his word. We want to become men and women of the word. So when you have that tendency to get very myopic and very narrow in your perspective and you begin to think like Elijah, I guess I'm the only one that hasn't bowed my knee. God comes and says, what are you talking about? There's 7,000 more. It stunned him. David says something very similar as he calls us to remember all of God's blessing in our lives in Psalms 103, 1 to 5. Would you read this out loud with me? Let's begin. Praise the Lord, I tell myself. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, I tell myself, and never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. Leave it right there, Fernando. Would you go back? Notice what he says. Praise the Lord, I will tell myself. Praise the Lord. I will tell myself not to forget the good things. This is a whole other teaching. What are you telling yourself on a daily basis? Oh, there's not enough money. Oh, I'm not very loved. I don't have any energy. I'm so apathetic. I don't think I'm going to get a raise. I don't think I can go on. Is that what you're telling yourself? The Bible says you've got to speak to your soul. I have to rise myself up. You say I have to do it when I don't feel like doing it. It's when I feel down. It's when I don't want to engage. That's when I say to myself, God is a good God. God loves me. He has a great purpose and a great plan for my life. Now, Scott, get your act together. Get going and move and take action. You have to tell yourself that. You have to rouse yourself. Does that make sense? I, I, I love, I'll sit there and cry when I watch these sports movies and I see a coach just lay into his team or her team and they get them all roused up. And one day the Holy Spirit said, you have to be your own coach. You can't wait for somebody. You can't wait for Polly or Mike or Dave to call you up and get you all rioted up. Sometimes you have to do that yourself. And you do that by remembering God's word and by remembering all the things that he has done for you. He has saved me. He has healed me. He has delivered me. He has provided for me. He has protected for me. He has you too. Hasn't he? Yes. Oh, Yeah. You've got to take that and remind yourself and stir yourself up. <coughs> Verse 3, let's continue. He forgives. Oh, oh start with, he, no, you're right, Fernando. He ransoms, let's begin. He ransoms me from death and surrounds me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. If you took just that phrase today and memorized that today, God has ransomed me. He has redeemed me from death. You surround me. The good thing to do is just take your arms and put your arms around yourself and go, you surround me with your love and your tender mercies. You fill my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagle.
Let me give you just a practical suggestion. If you're struggling with a time of doubt right now, I would encourage you to list the amount of time you give personally to worshiping God. When Whitney or one of the worship people say, come on, church, let's just raise our voice. I listened. This morning when they said, let's raise our voice, I didn't hear anybody. As pastor, my heart sank. Personal worship is so important that when you're talking to yourself during the day, you fill your mind with worship and with praise for Jesus Christ and for your Savior. One of my favorite things in the last month is when we're going through the book of Revelation is to take all the prayers, join in with the four living beasts, join in with the 24 living elders, join in with the millions of angels and cry out, holy, 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 holy is our Lord and God. You are worthy to receive praise and adulation and exaltation. Just join in with heaven right off the biblical print and just teach, train yourself to become a person of worship. Why? Worship will, will help you remember God's track record in your life. Look at letter B. Trust God's character and power. Psalm 77, 13 and 14 says this. Oh God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? The answer is no. You are the God of miracles and wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. Asaph says it not only helps me deal with my doubts to realize God's power, but to realize God's character. He is a good God. He's a loving God. His love, the Bible says, is unfailing, and it never ceases, and it never ends. And he is a forgiving God. He's a merciful God. Stir yourself up and remind yourself when I'm walking down the hill. That's what I say every morning. Thank you, Jesus, that I, when I awoke this morning, I am serving uh, you. You love me. You have a purpose for my life. You have a plan for my life. You've given me power for my life. You've given me your pur purity for my life. You've given me all these good promises out of 2 Peter 1, 3 to 7 that I need. I'm going to make it this morning. I don't feel like it, but I know I will. And you just fill your heart, you fill your mind with that. In other words, God's character can be trusted. Psalms 34, 8. Would you read this with me? Let's begin. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who trust in him. Psalms 119, 1 and 2 says this. Joyful are the people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws, and I love this, and search for him with all their hearts. There's a whole teaching on how to become joyful. Become a person who follows his instructions and become a person who obey his law and search for him with all your heart. And what's the result? Joy. Isn't that good? Yeah. Well, two of us, Eddie, yeah. think that. <laughs> this is why I love this statement. Make sure you get this in your notes. Even when God's hand can't be traced, his heart can be trusted. Amen. When it gets so dark that you don't know what his hand's doing, you can always default to, but I trust his heart because his heart is good. The longer you walk with God and the more intimately you come to know him, the more you will rest in his truth that God cannot and will not compromise his character. Verse 3 in Psalm 119, after the joyfulness, says this, and they will not compromise with evil, and they will walk only in his path. When you begin to commit your life to the character of God that is flawless, you know what happens? It begins to change your character. If you find yourself compromising a lot, if you find yourself distrusting a lot, become a man, become a woman of worship, become a man, become a woman of the word. That's the best heart tonic I know. Hebrews 6, 18 to 19 says this. So God has given us both a promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can take new courage. For we cannot 
hold to his promise. Excuse me, for we can hold to his promise with confidence. This confidence is like a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain of heaven into God's inner sanctuary. He says that the character of God becomes an anchor for years of my soul. So we can't just get blown around with all the difficulties in life. So even when life and confusion and doubts toss me around, my life is anchored in this fact. God can be tr trusted. And then look at letter C. Celebrate your future. Celebrate your future. Psalm 77, 15, Asa says this. You have redeemed your people by your strength. I encourage you to circle the word redeemed. It's kind of a churchy word, but it just simply means this, that God has purchased you out of slavery, slavery to sin, slavery to Satan. For those of us who have entered into a personal relationship with Christ, we are redeemed from Satan, sin, and selfishness. We have been spiritually changed and transformed. We have been given eternal life. Skip slide 34, please. Jim Collins, in his book, Good to Great, recounts this fascinating discussion he had with Admiral Jim Stockdale. Jim was the highest-ranking military officer as a POW in the camp that affectionately became known as the Hanoi Hilton. From 1965 to 1973, he was in that camp, and he was tortured more than 20 times with this unimaginable brutality that had left him crippled to, even to today. When Collins asked the admiral how he made it through this time of uncertainty in the camp, listen to what he said. Admiral Stockdale said, I never, never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that would I get out, but I also would prevail in the end and turn the experience into a defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. Biblical hope is not passive waiting. Biblical hope is not ignorant denial. It's not wishful thinking. Biblical hope is not blind optimism. It is squaring off and faithfully directing your doubts head on, and you cling to God's character and his promised future anyway. That is biblical hope. Hope is trusting in God and in his character and in his nature and that what he says he will fulfill. Period. No matter how bad it gets, I can be murdered for my life. God says, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you win at the end because he's already won. No one exemplifies this better than Job, whose life was completely turned upside down, who got no answers from heaven, whose mind was filled with doubt, yet it still says this in Job 19, 25 to 27. But as for me, there's that remembering. There's that intentional recall. I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body will I see God. This is pretty profound because there wasn't a real strong theology of resurrection in the Old Testament. But Job had eyes to see. Do you think there was something about the devastation of losing his children, losing his health, losing all his wealth and all his livestock? Sometimes when your physical eyes get messed with, your spiritual eyes begin to see in ways you've never seen before. Yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. In other words, in spite of the uncertainty of his circumstances, he was absolutely certain about his destiny, and you can too. So as I wind down, I want to get really practical. You see a line in your notes there that says, what is my next step? What I'd like you to do in the next minute or so is to consider what is it that God really wants you to take away in a practical way from our time today? I want you to encourage to write something in there. Maybe it's, 
I need to spend or I commit to spending more time in God's word. For some of you, this might be the first time that you're actually going to pick up what this next three months, it's, uh, it's green. You're going to pick up the bookmark and say, you know what? I'm going to commit to this. I want to see God daily in his word. Psalms 119.18 says this, open my eyes to see the wonderful truth in your instruction. I say that every day. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Remove the scales so I can see you in the word of God. That you become familiar with, familiar with the stories of God. Some of you say, but you know, I just don't like that Bible bookmark. You know, I want to just focus in on one verse. Listen, the best thing you can do for the next five to six years is just become extremely comfortable with all the stories in the Bible, with all the promises that God has said in the Bible. You don't want to be a one-book woman or a one-book man or a one-verse man or woman. You need to know the full scope of what God has to say from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Little pet peeve, just so you know, it's not revelations, it's revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. You want to be versed in that, okay? Maybe for some of you, it's just picking up those CDs like we've talked about and begin to fill your mind with worship and the adoration of God. What is it that, that you know you need to do that's going to help lead you to your breakthrough this year. And then next week, we're going to end this series. I know it's going to be January 7th, but I want to speak to you for hope for change. What the Lord said to me and why he crafted this series for me this way is if you struggle feeling defeated, if you struggle feeling depressed, if you struggle feeling discouraged on an ongoing basis, if you struggle with doubt, good chance you don't feel like you can change. That's why we systematically have attacked it at this level during this wonderful season. That you can have victory over defeat, that you can win over depression, that you can advance through discouragement that you will take your doubts and let God build a deep faith because the breakthrough that we're going to have this year is. If you're like me, growing up, because of the dysfunctionality in our home, even though it was a pastor's home, my depression was fueled by, I can't change. I want to lose weight. I'm just fat. I'm going to be 70, 80 pounds over the rest of my life. I'm not very skilled. I'm not very smart. I fought for a long time, church, that I would be homeless. I was married with two kids, and I would go to bed at night, sleep, worrying and weeping over the fact that I would end up homeless. Hope, homeless. Now you look at me and go, well, that's stupid. Well, no, it wasn't stupid. It was really real to me. Why? Because defeat had won. Depression was conquering me. I was discouraged out of the get-go. This is real life stuff for me. This isn't just theory. This is real. God wants to lift us up and above so we can be the effective people he's called us to be because there is a world going to hell in a handbasket. And we are the messengers. We are his ambassadors. Does this make sense? So this is real for me. I hope it's real for you. And you'll know if it's real. You're going to take this bookmark and you're going to start reading. You're going to turn the television off. You're going to turn Hulu off. You're going to turn your iPod off. And you're going to go, I'm going to commit to getting through the Bible once through the, in the entire year and the New Testament twice, twice. Why? Because your life depends on it. Amen? Amen. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are just overwhelmed with your love for us. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you have a deep, deep, deep passion for us and that your purposes and your plans are alive and well. And I just pray and I declare over Crescenta Valley Church, Lord, that this is the year, 2018, of breakthrough. 
We're going to break through the barriers that have held us back spiritually and emotionally and relationally and financially and vocationally and intellectually and uh, physically. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.